Hi, I'm Richard Sefton, and this is my podcast, State of Mind, with me, Richard Sefton. Today's episode was actually recorded on January 6th, and since then I've had some massive changes in my personal life, which if you listen to the last episode, you'll know all about. But for this reason, this episode has been delayed, and I owe a massive apology to the amazing guest. Since January, a hell of a lot has happened in the world as a whole, so please, no DMs asking why we didn't discuss the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. My guest today will be celebrating a decade in Parliament this year, first entering in that magical year 2012 when, as a Brit, everything seemed possible. There was a feeling of togetherness, positivity, love and respect in the air. Since then, I think it's fair to say that things have changed a little bit. Labour MP under three different leaders and indeed three different PMs. He has been a part of some of the biggest political changes in this country, at least in my 40 years, if not forever, and not scared at all to stand up for what he believes in. Andy McDonald, welcome. How the devil are you? I'm very well, Richard. And you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Um, It's a pleasure to have you joining me and I'm looking forward to finding out all about you, so I'm all good. Okay, well, that sounds scary. Well, let's just get straight into it then. Tell me about your early life. Whereabouts did you grow up? Um, well, I'm I'm speaking from the place that I was born, Middlesbrough. Um, uh, pretty straightforward upbringing. Oh, no, is that true? I don't know. Um, family of eight in a quite a small semi-detached house. Um, and uh, yeah, I've come from Irish Scots stock. People. Middlesbrough is a sort of uh, a town that everybody came from somewhere else, and in our case, it's predominantly Ireland. People coming for the iron and steel way back in the day, uh, and I'm the product of of that lineage. So Irish heritage, Catholic family, um, and I'm absolutely so proud to be representing my hometown. Sounds very much like Liverpool, I suppose. Yeah, there are lots of similarities uh, in the nature of the the character of the people. Um, I just watched Anne, um, you know, the story of one mother from Hillsborough, and you know that so resonated. And it's not only just the the story that is uh, universally resonating, but there's also a cultural synergy there for me as well. I, I get it. Um, so yeah, it, there are a lot of similarities between the two places. Yeah, I've just finished episode two. I'm having to do it quite slowly because it's you know it, it's quite emotional. Yeah, well, I won't spoil it because it it is terribly emotional, um, but so so relevant and important to this day in terms of Absolutely. how we respond. Yeah. Yeah, there's been so much fighting and activism through uh, for Hillsborough through so many different mediums. Maybe. You know, it could just take that 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 one thing, you know, a TV show, a drama, to do that, to take it that one step further, possibly. The arts are so powerful in this respect um, because memories fade and people's um, interpretations um, can get somewhat lost in the midst of time, and when something is done like that and you'll see it when you finish the watching the, all the episodes it just tells it in such a compelling way and this gross injustice that was there throughout um, it's an impressive and powerful piece of work but there are other stories to tell too um, mm. and you know I had the privilege to meet with the Shrewsbury 24 campaigners and it took them 47 years uh, to secure justice in their cause. And I just, I, I, and at times when I get a little bit beleaguered and, and downtrodden, I just look to these incredible people and think, my goodness, how on earth did you sustain and stick the course over such a long, long period of time in pursuit of justice? Uh, I, it is... It's overwhelming, really, um, but inspirational yeah. at the same time. Yeah, you say the word overwhelming. I think that's what I was feeling when I watched the first episode. You know, that um, how did she keep going? How do you keep going when, when you're going through something like that? And it, It's just... Um, it, it, the resilience is just... It, it shines, it, maybe the wrong word to use, but it, 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 it it's so powerful. It is. It, it's absolutely remarkable how people just will not take 
know for an answer, if they know in their bones that there's been a gross injustice and that the establishment has conspired against them to keep them away from the truth, people like this are just t completely relentless um, and they do, they do not give up. And we, you know, we see these inspirational stories and, you know, um, Archbishop uh, Tutu died not so long ago. I thought, you know, that, that campaign, the anti-apartheid campaign, people say, no, we're not going to give up. This is totally wrong and we're going to persevere until we prevail. Um, and it is just awe-inspiring and wonderful. Uh, and as I say, completely inspirational to anybody, whether you're in politics or any other walk of life. It's um, inspiring. Yeah, I can hear passion in your voice when you're saying that, and that's quite inspiring. Did you always know that you wanted to get into politics? Um, no. Uh, well, a checkered life, really. I, I was involved as a... I was a lawyer for a long time, yeah. and I had my own firm. I stumbled uh, across various um, specialisms and ended up um, just by happen chance representing members of the armed forces and thinking how on earth do I do this because the law changed and of course we we got on with that and I became quite a, a specialist in, in in that respect and just by dint of those circumstances I came up against the authorities the Ministry of Defence in particular and you know found myself having to really battle uh, to secure justice for people in those circumstances there was always that that sense of um, trying to combat injustice and acknowledging that this was a very unequal and unfair world um, it expressed itself through legal practice but I was always there as a member of the Labour Party I came into the politics as uh, uh, per se in response to Margaret Thatcher people say who inspires you um, well she was the catalyst and when she inspired me but when she stood on the steps of Downing Street and started to recite the, um, the prayer of St Francis of Assisi, I could feel my blood turn cold because I knew that she was about the exact opposite. And that, that launched me into joining the Labour Party. Um, I need to listen again, but I'm pretty certain when I spoke to Edwina Curry, um, those words that were spoken on the steps of Downing Street that turned your blood cold did the complete opposite for her. Well, I mean, yeah, but what, what, what does it, you say, where, where there is darkness, let there be light, where there is despair, let there be hope. And what did that Prime Minister do? She sowed despair and darkness for so many people. Um, so, and I knew that was coming. And of course, it all unfolded in the way that, that we, we all know about and live with to this day. She's turned the social contract upside down. And we see it with continuing outsourcing and privatisation, the hallmarks of Thatcherism and Reaganism that's just poisoned the body politic and, and our economy, um, amongst other things. And we, could, we could go on for the entire duration of this discussion talking about the harm that she did to our country. Um, but that did provoke me into saying, well, I need to find a voice somewhere. And so I became active in politics from that moment on, but principally in the background, um, as uh, just taking up various positions, and I was cajoled and persuaded to um, stand as a councillor in the 1990s, uh, and it developed from there. And then all of a sudden you find yourself standing on the podium in 2012. Absolutely, yeah, that was, that was remarkable. I mean, um, I made, made my mind that I wanted to stand for for Parliament be, before then, and then my predecessor um, uh, passed away, and that the opportunity was there, and you know, and, and I and I and I took it. I had had actually gone for the seat of Middlesbrough South and East Cleveland um, some time before. My lovely friend Ashok Kumar, um, he he died, and uh, colleagues did say, well, look you should really stand. And I, and I almost got it. I look, just lost that selection by a few, a handful of votes. And then uh, that was in 2010. And then I had a, a major illness. I had a, 
2011 and on the 4th of July uh, 2011 I had a triple heart bypass oh, okay. um, so that was uh, <coughs> oh, uh, that was a bit of a shock to the system okay. um, but I felt then that when I came out of that I thought I've got so much more to do uh, and I think I, I think I said that to my priest at the time. I said, I can't, I can't be succumbing to this. I've got to, um, there's things I need to do. And I, I do actually want to become a Member of Parliament for my hometown. And then the way, <coughs> excuse me, events unfolded, that's exactly what happened the following year. Um, did you say that you said that to your priest? I did. So were you quite religious then? Yes, yes, I, I make no buzz about that. My, my very good friend Tom O'Neill, uh, he came to our parish and he had a triple heart bypass, and he was so he was off, and so he came to to see me in hospital, um, knowing the sort of um, journey I was on, and he came to see me, and uh, he was really lovely, uh, and still is. He's a great friend, uh, and I told him I said, look, Tom, I, I've got things to do. I can't be lying here for too long, so. Um, and then he, he, he brought me up because then he gave me a blessing uh, and then I, I, I got on with it. Uh, but yeah, uh, I stood the next year when that, the by-election came and that, it, that was incredible. Um, and, you know, I'm re-plumbed, rewired and um, getting on with it. Uh, I, I, but my, my ambition was to be um, a decent constituency member of parliament. And of course... When I went into uh, the House of Commons, uh, notwithstanding that people like um, Tom Watson said, we don't need any more lawyers. Uh, we want people from much more worthy backgrounds than blooming lawyers. Uh, I said, well, oh, we've got a vacancy on the Justice Select Committee. We need a lawyer. Uh, will you do it? So I did that. And, and I think at that time, Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell, I don't think they'd been allowed to serve on select committees. Um, but they they joined me on the on the justice select committee, which was, which was really good. It was a, it was a good time to be involved in that, trying to trying to hold back some of the ridiculous forces that were at play. For example, Chris Grayling's ill-fated privatisation of the probation service. You know, we pointed out that this would not work and it would end in tears. It didn't work and it did end in tears. Um, so that was quite remarkable. Um, and then, of course, when we get to 2015 and, and the defeat, um, well, I threw my support behind Andy Burnham and, um, you know, with, with little regard for... Uh, oh, let me put it this way. I just didn't think Jeremy Corbyn had a chance. I thought, yeah. this, this, is, this is pie in the sky. That's never going to happen. And um, I was good friends with Jeremy, and uh, he had in one of his rallies at um, Middlesbrough Town Hall on a wet Tuesday afternoon. There's about fourteen hundred people came to the rally, and I, and I, introdu I introduced him. He said, "He said we're not going to fall out." I said, "Absolutely not, no, no." Um, so I introduced him, and I could just sense, oh, there was something happening here. This is quite remarkable i had not expected this and there was this buzz ar around the event and around the offer that he was making and of course as we know um andy andy lost and and and, and jeremy jeremy won um and i was you know it was quite bizarre because i hitherto i'd been um pps to emily thornbury who she was shadow attorney general then they asked me to uh, so what I moved to Bays to you, you might remember a chap called Chukra Muna. Yeah. Gone along to help him. Yeah. Well, that was that was an experience. <laughs> Isn't he a Lib Dem now? I, 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 what, 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 what day of the week is it? You know. So yeah, that was that was an eye opener. Um, and then when Jeremy won, I got a call from um, John McDonnell, uh, and he said, "Look, um, I've got a favour to ask. Would you?" be my PPS uh, I thought um, I said well what part will I play and he said no you'll be heavily involved so you know you'll be there'll be people that I'm engaged with Mariana Mazzucato Thomas Piketty and all these sort of uh, and Prem Prem Sicker and all these 
wonderful economists and I thought oh goodness me this is just remarkable you know from where I started out a few years before to be suddenly in this sort of company would be would be just stunningly good and so I, I, I took the position up um, for a short period um, lots of uh, entertainment you remember the event where John produced the uh, little red book at the dispatch box and I absolutely livid with him and I just said <laughs> and we joked about it afterwards I, I, he, he alleges that I also I, I, I body searched him before he went into the chamber on each occasion thereafter uh, which wasn't actually true but it's 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 uh, it's there's an element of truth I was watching him like a hawk uh, but <laughs> it was he was so entertaining and then of course it just then spiraled um, with the uh, the resignations and the, the attempted coups, um, mm. and um, Jeremy asked me to be shadow rail minister, and then a few months thereafter, shadow secretary of state for transport, um, which I took on with relish. I, mean, I I really enjoyed the role, and of course I was blessed with fantastic advisors, um, uh, Dr. Ian Taylor of the Transport for Quality of Life. Um, is is I, I call him a guru, a transport guru. But working with him, we were able to actually bring to life our intention to bring about an integrated railway in public ownership. And that, that white paper that we produced after four years of very hard work um, stands the test of time. And even senior people in the rail industry say that it isn't mad and it would work. Um, and it certainly would work. So, yeah, it, it's been a, an incredible trajectory. And, of course, at, as per with um, leadership elections, I supported Andy Burnham. I threw my support behind Jeremy once he was the elected leader of our party. Similarly, when and Keir uh, came about, whilst I didn't support him, and I told him that, I said, you will win, and when you do win, I will support you wholeheartedly. And, and of course, I took on the the role of Shadow Secretary of State for Employment Rights and Protections, which I consider to be the heart and soul of the Labour Party. That's why we exist. Um, yeah. So um, it's been quite a journey. So you definitely class yourself as a socialist. What does socialism mean to you? Yeah, basically what... what have you, I don't know about you, I think about what, what does it mean to be a socialist. I think about that every single day. And I just think about the, the incredible ingenuity of humanity. Uh, um, and its creativity and its compassion, and you know that we are, and it manifests itself now as because we're at a crossroads, are we not? You know, we can carry on with what we've had hitherto, which has been exploitative and extractive e uh, economics, or we can take a different course where we actually do reach out and include everybody and think about the best interests of us all, rather than just an elite. Uh, and that we can achieve that better world if we, if we work together in that way. And it says it on the back of the card, we achieve so much more uh, by working together than we do as individuals. So I, I see that as a, just that common decency, that respect that we need to show one another. And for me, socialism has always been the, the way that we can secure that. The, the, the alternatives deliver the exact opposite. It's just um, wealth reposing in the hands of uh, a minority, whilst the rest of the, the world uh, struggles, struggles on. And we've, we saw that through the pandemic. I mean, there was something like, I don't know how many billionaires there are in the US, but their wealth grew in two years, so much so that I think they had the ability to write a cheque to every man, woman and child in the United States of America to the tune of $3,000 and still have the same wealth that they started with. And there's all, all manner of ways we can illustrate the gross inequalities that there are in this world. Um, and I think there's a better way to, to do it. And there are a lot of voices at the moment um, saying these things um, in important areas. You, you have... Pope Francis uh, intervening uh, with his recent uh, work, Let Us Dream. You've got Joe Biden saying things about um, the 
the merits and the virtues of the collective, that trade unionists should be able to negotiate and bargain for the best possible outcome, not simply receive whatever they deign to receive from um, more powerful people than them. So I, I, I think we're at, a, at, a, at a, a very interesting juncture in our, uh, an important one as well in, in, in our world and there are major choices to be made. I agree. However, I feel that we have been living one way for such a long time that it gives people over there on that side kind of ammunition um, to sort of say, well, look over there, that's changed, that's scary. You don't want that. Stick with what you know. There is. And of course, those are vested interests who want to perpetuate mm. that because that's mm. that's what they're about. Um, but I just cast my mind back to 2017 and you get a lot of people saying, you know, that was a, a failure and, a, and the policies rejected. I've just got to say, very clearly, that's not true. If you look at any academic evidence, be it from University of Greenwich or Loughborough or, or as a few other um, notable works, the policies themselves were immensely attractive. Um, my look, for example, at the national care service that was being promoted, you know, the, the pandemic has just confirmed that that was that was the right way to go other things that were 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 mentioned in the in the in the manifesto they were popular what wasn't popular was 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 the brexit conundrum and and obviously jeremy corbyn was i mean the, I mean, the campaign against him was remarkably successful he was demonized and vilified in a way which i've never seen any individual in british politics um, I've never seen that happen to anybody before uh, to such a degree. Um, there's always nasty things said about leaders of, of, of parties, but that was off the scale and so unfair and unjust. Um, but the policies themselves were attractive and it was a moment of real hope. Um, and I think we've got to hold on to that um, and, and promote it as best we can. And of course, I, I'd like to think I did... Um, something towards that in the green paper that i produced in terms of a new deal for working people because you know the what we've been the characterization of industrial relations in our economy over the past 50 years has been the lack of voice of working people being having a say over their futures and we're now embarking upon this um, new um, era that embraces the green industrial revolution um, which is absolutely right. You know, we've got a, a planet that's dying. We've got to have the right response to, to, to save it. And that's a huge part of it. Um, but we say, don't we, that there are economic opportunities here. But it's got to be the ones that produce good, secure, um, well-paid, unionised jobs um, for the people who've been excluded from this thus far. There's a real opportunity to change the dynamic here. Um, the alternative is just to carry on using it as an opportunity for, to, for capital to rest and exploit and do the same old thing that we've been doing for the last 150 years. Um, so we can change it, should we wish. It's a question of political will. Um, but it's trying to engage and make that offer that, that, that attracts people to want to support it politically. So I suppose it's safe to say that the Labour Party is different under Sir Keir Starmer, but would you still say that it's moving in the right direction? Obviously, I had my um, difference of, of opinion that led to my uh, resignation. Um, and I, I don't regret that because I think it was a, you know, there comes a point where you've just got to say, you know, these are the things that you, you, you believe in and hold, hold dear. But I am heartened that... You know, when he was pressed, he gave a speech not a few days ago um, and about this key issue of the 10 pledges that he made um, when he became leader. Because he's been challenged about this and criticised. They said, well, are you resiling from them? And he said unequivocally in answer to a question that he stands by them. So I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, and I'll, I want to do what I can to help populate those pledges with detailed policy that actually give it meaning. Um, so, yeah, I think, we, obviously, there's, 
there's been a, a change of tone and a change of uh, of of direction in in some respects. I don't have to agree with all of that. I I will hold dear to the principles I believe in, and try to make sure that we do address some of these gross and offensive inequalities that obtain in our society uh, right now, and we just see it on a daily basis. I mean, I am just absolutely in despair at times at the levels of corruption in our country. I believe that we are a deeply corrupt country, and yet we we strut across the world stage as if we we're. Uh, 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 are we talking from the top to the bottom or just the top or we are talking top to bottom we are talking top to bottom just look at the stories that keep coming emerging on a daily basis mm -hmm. um in terms of just the the internal um morality of, of the conservative party at the very top I mean, it's based on exploitation and cronyism uh, yeah. And and you know back scratching and the rest of it. It's not a meritocracy. It's a question of people buying their positions in the House of Lords, um, and you know, it, it, and we see it writ large at every level of our society. It, it isn't done in an open, transparent way based on meritocracy. It's about it's a it's it's a chumocracy that is corrupting our our society. Um, and it needs fundamental reform. Um, uh, but, you know, at the moment, you've got a, the party that enjoys the benefits of that uh, chumocratic arrangement. Um, they're not going to be changing that anytime soon. It suits them. And they have been masterful at manipulating the agenda to, 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 to sustain them in power. Um, so the challenge is immense, but... I, I I really do think, you know, if you, to stand any chance of of having a, a a better, a decent society, that whole attitude and way of doing business has to change. We cannot have it that people. You've just seen it with the Lord Guite in, inquiry into this silly business over the over the, um, the the Downing Street. I'm sat here looking at my wallpaper in my spare room and I'm thinking I could do with changing that. I can't afford that price though. Well, absolutely, but you know, but he's he's not been honest. Okay. The, the man is not honest, he's not direct. It, we see at the house, it, we see him at the, the dispatch box just a few days ago when he was actually just told a direct falsehood when it's brought to his attention. That was a direct contradiction of what he told a journalist. His instinct was to run away and just leave that, leave the chamber. Notwithstanding that he was next up, it was a statement from him. Uh, so I don't know where he was running to. What part do you think Sir Lindsay Hoyle should play in that? Well, he did. He said, "Sit down, Prime Minister. Don't go. You're not going anywhere." What about no? Before that, uh, he said something along the lines of, "You don't have to correct the record if you don't want to." Well, that's 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 our crazy parliamentary um, uh, protocols and procedures. Okay. You had Dawn Butler. Quite openly saying on her feet in the comments, the man's a liar, and and yet she's punished for saying so. Uh, but he is a liar, and yeah. we and we know we know that to be accurate. It, it it is default setting is to deny and lie. Um, but you know he he's successfully got to the top job in our country, and that really should concern us. We you know the standards have have been so abused and and, and reduced. Um, uh, that it is, it, sh it should concern everybody. Well, it certainly concerns me and a lot of people that I know. And it, and then you still hear people saying the line that almost chills me. Oh, he's trying his best. Oh, well, it, lots of things come as a, a as a surprise. Um, and you know, I, I I'm from a part of England that saw uh, many Conservative MPs returned. And the one that stuck with me was the, the remark from the Hartlepool by-election that, you know, Labour are a disgrace, that uh, didn't have any um, food banks under Labour. And we've got nine on the Conservative Party, so good for them. They've, they've done well by us. And I thought, really? Is this, has this become the acid test of how many food banks we have? I think the opposite is true. Mm. You know, and I think most people would, but the fact that somebody would go to the polls and say... No, I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that we've got so many uh, food banks. I'm going to vote for the party that's, that's made this happen. 
I would. I thought it was a, it was a good reason to kick them out. Uh, I don't want any food banks, quite frankly. You know. Um, so yeah, it it is it is chilling, um, uh, and I am, you know. Whilst I, I try to remain optimistic, and that there is hope, and uh, and there is this opportunity, which way is it going to turn? And you look across the pond at the United States, and hearing from Joe Biden having to still fight the fights of of last year and the previous four years, um, because of the fear of that re-emerging uh, of Trump uh, returning to the throne. Um, that is absolutely utterly terrifying. If people cannot see that the man is a complete basket case, and it would be a disaster for not only the United States but for the, for the for the entire world. My fear is that if he becomes president again, we won't see another president until he's gone, until he's uh, died. No, I think I think that's where the only thing that you know nobody lasts forever. Um, that's the the the, the only um, solace. Uh, but what 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 harm that man would do in, a, in another term is just terrifying, uh, absolutely and utterly terrifying, and nothing is off the table. Um, um, but my goodness, um, that he would still gain such credence after, after f- four years of, of, of his disastrous presidency, and not only that, the way in which he, he left office, that should have been enough to say, oh my goodness, uh, that should never happen. I don't know whether you've seen Don't Look Up, but it's... Uh... Yes, I did. I absolutely loved it. I thought Meryl Streep did a brilliant job of parody- parodying um, Mr. Trump. Um, there is so much unfairness around. My partner worked in a supermarket all through the pandemic. I mean, he worked there before as well, uh, but he worked in a supermarket all through the pandemic. Um, this is uh, related to the question that you asked the Prime Minister's Question Times on Wednesday. Um he is customer facing whereas his managers are less so and yet if he was to go off sick he worked all all through the pandemic um put himself on the line even in those really scary times at the start when we were all terrified um he was there right on the front line facing customers some without masks some refusing to wear masks some before even the masks even got to the you know till it got to the stage where we had to wear masks um many people in the shop at once before the um the rules around how many people should be in shops uh, came in. Yet, if he got sick and went off, we would be, he would be on so much little money, £80 a week, something like that. Um, and it almost wouldn't make sense for him to stay off. Whereas the manager, because we've got a friend who's who's a manager in the same shop, uh, same company, um, would get full whack uh, for a job where they're sitting more in the back, more, more you know, less customer fa- facing. So I thank you for that question because it, it, it's important. It is. It's grossly unfair and the poorest get the least. Uh, but to have a, a situation where, you know, you've had minister after minister openly admit that they could not live on ninety six pounds a week. Um, it wouldn't. It wouldn't cover a decent lunch uh, for, for somebody like Boris Johnson, and he dismissed his his extra job at two hundred fifty thousand pounds as chicken feed. His his words, not mine. He described two hundred fifty thousand pounds a year as chicken feed. Um, they have total contempt and disregard for the working class, um, and hopefully that's now becoming uh, evident. But to think that we have an economic structure that penalises the poor and rewards the richest in our society is an absolute anathema. It's an insult, and we've got to correct that. Um, The fact that somebody earns less than £120 a week means that in the event of them becoming ill, they get no statutory sick pay. Where is the morality in, in that? Um, so we need a completely new economic settlement and if that and and at the heart of that there's got to be tax justice and we've got a a taxation system that is fairer Uh, those Mm. with the we talk about those with the broader shoulders they certainly should um, uh, bear a greater uh, uh, share of the strain it is offensive in the extreme that people who um, profit very largely through doing nothing by their capital gains are taxed at a lower rate than those who go out to do one of the important jobs that we've all so 
praised over the last several years, supermarket workers, lorry drivers, uh, our nurses and so on. You know, we, 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 we're full of warm words, but we don't put, put in place um, a, a more equitable um, taxation system that would see people on the lowest earnings uplifted. It's completely tilted in the wrong direction. And not only are the, those very people going to be suffering hikes in national insurance contributions and of course massive increases, massive increases in their energy bills come next April. I just shudder to think what the next 12 months is going to bring in that respect. You've got this crazy situation of, 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 of this tax system whereby national insurance contributions are paid at 12% and then once you get to £50,000 a year it drops to 2%. Well, well how about let's just Let's cut it to 10% all the way across the board, but keep it going through all the income streams. What would that do for our treasury receipts? I tell you what, it would be tens of billions of pounds to the best, to the good that we could invest in our national care service or any or our health service or anywhere else that we, 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 we deemed appropriate. There are choices to be made here. And at the moment, as a nation, we're making the wrong ones. Would you ever be interested in standing for leader? No. No, no. One or two um, people who probably took leave of their senses have suggested that to me in, in, in the, over the over the years. Um, oh no, I just think I just don't think it's it would be for me. Um, I think there's plenty of people in the parliamentary Labour Party who'd be sh- shouting, saying, "You're damn right, <laughs> it isn't for you." So um, I, I, perhaps if I'd been younger. Um, I'm 63 going 64. I was going to say, you're only 63. That's the same age as my mum and dad. And, and Joe Biden's 78, but, you know. Um, but uh, I, I do think it's a, it's a, it's a hugely difficult uh, job to do. But you come into politics and remarkable things happen. And I th- uh, Mark Drakeford, was, um, First Minister of Wales, was, was delivering the... Uh, an Iron Bevan memorial lecture a few months ago, and he quoted Nye Bevan saying, "To uh, politics um, uh, demands a very heavy price of people personally, and uh, so it's very very important that you don't devote your attentions to trivial issues. If you're going to pay the price, make sure that you know you 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 you're paying attention to the fundamentals and the important things that will be transformative of people's lives." So I get that, but I, I think that um, whatever I would wish for myself personally in terms of any career moves, uh, I think the chances of me ever becoming leader of the Labour Party are incredibly, incredibly remote, and I just don't think it's for me. OK, then allow me one more question on that subject. If Keir Starmer wasn't the leader, who would you like to see as the leader? Oh, wow. Um... Well, I've often thought that you know, you know Labour Party's done so much in terms of improving um, its representation in terms of gender and ethnicity. Yeah. But we've never had a, a woman full-time leader. We've had two interim leaders who were women. So, you know, there are, there's such talent amongst our um, our benches that you know it could come from. From anywhere, so uh, uh, and some of the twenty nineteen intake, I, I think are just staggeringly good, um, and perhaps it's too soon for for many of them, but I think in the fullness of time, you will see people emerge from that um, cohort who will become very significant leaders uh, in the decades ahead. Um, but I don't know. Perhaps perhaps the. Uh, we we go into the next election. When's it going to be? Twenty twenty three, twenty twenty four. You know, I want Keir Starmer to be in number ten. Um, I, I um, you know, I I I take that option in a heartbeat. Um, you know, for, uh, he's a he's a decent man. He's a serious man, uh, and you know, if he's uh, with his. Um, recommitment to the pledges that he made as, 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 in the leadership contest uh, I want to see that happen uh, but if he was not to be there tomorrow um, 
there are a number of people who come forward. Um, I, I, I'm convinced, um, but I, th I do think it should be a woman. Um, I've, I've said that for a while. That may not be, may may not happen, and perhaps the person who's going to become the next leader isn't even in Parliament right now. Who knows? Well, there's a thought. Um, I can think of a few that I that I'd kind of that that I would love to see um, be in charge. Angela Rayner, I love. I love her. I love how she's she's kept her northern accent, and um, I I I love how she uses words off the cuff like scum. Um, I love um, yeah, Angela Rayner, um, amazing. Um, even people like Jess Phillips, and I know that they get the the they're controversial and uh, but everyone likes different things. I, I mean, I see strength in her. So Angela Rayner. Uh, Jess Phillips um, for me would be I made Dawn Butler love Dawn Butler you know if someone's a liar call them a liar but as I say um, Jess Phillips kind of brings out a, a bad reaction on Twitter um, controversial yeah I, I, that's an interesting one it's the upset um, I, we, we certainly live in an age where the way to get attention is to say something provocative um, and perhaps outlandish and upsetting and I, I don't agree yeah. I really don't agree with that um, I, I find that one of the most distasteful aspects of, of, of politics not just modern day it's always been the case but I don't know why people can't speak um, with passion in something about something they believe in based upon evidence and, and, and be treated with respect um, and we just we've got too much uh, both across the parties and inside political parties where one person will say something it's because of their associations or or perceived associations that they're, they're condemned and rejected rather than listening to what they've said um, so I find that one of the most distasteful aspects of, of politics but perhaps it's always been like that and I should just um, accept it for I don't know. I think there was a a big change. Um, like I said at the start in twenty twelve, we were full of respect and love, and there was there was a dream and and like a common goal. And being a Brit wasn't something to be used against us. I heard Andrew Rosendale today. Uh, you know, calling the woke karate. And you know, if 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 you don't believe this, then you must be unpatriotic. You must believe this to be patriotic. I mean, it, it's just got a bit ridiculous now. It, it, that, that has just become such a twisted view, this uh, being proud of your country and patriotism and nationalism. It's all become a horrible, febrile uh, discussion. You know, you, you, if you're... We're, surely we're all patriotic about wanting the best for our people and, and proud of the things that um, people are doing. Look at our National Health Service. Oh, it, doesn't have, it doesn't make you swell with pride. But I think this um, abuse of nationalism is, is, is so dangerous. Um, I, you know, it's, I'm, I, I, I don't want to be judged by you know, what the, the, the aggressive nature of, of our relationship with other, other nations. I want to a much more collaborative, cooperative um, association with other entities, not ones of, 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 of aggression, which some people seem to think is the only way to, to go. And to think back to it, we just, you know, hold up the Union flag and, and, and hark back to halcyon days of empire. That's not relevant. That really isn't relevant. And, it, and that all becomes quite twisted because, of course, we can be pr proud of the ingenuity and the, and the compassion of the people of our country. But we've also got to be realistic about and, and honest about our own history and our own place in the world right now and the responsibilities that we owe um, internally and externally. There should be, we should be much more frank than we currently are and more realistic rather than just symbols of, of, of nationalism as some sort of crutch to, to rely on or just to get a message home that this is you know, the only way to go about it. And I, I feel that very deeply every time we have a remembrance uh, um, parade, mm -hmm. is that, you know, and the minister we have um, locally 
he expresses it so beautifully about the about the people who made that sacrifice. And I think you know, I think about them. Oh, another good film I recommend to you: The, the War Below. Wonderful film uh, that came out about tunnelers in the First World War and how they went about their business to protect people of the, their own class. That's why they did it. They didn't do it because some bigwig told them to do it. It's because they knew what they were doing would be about saving the lives of their of their comrades. And it's a beautiful movie. Um, in, very, in very trenches, moving. Or? Yeah, in the, in the Battle of the Somme. Um, but it's a remarkable film. Uh, I thought it, it's on a, on a pretty cheap budget. But I thought that, to me, uh, was a, a beautiful uh, expression of, uh, of, 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 of patriotism um, uh, that resonated with me. My problem is that I'm one of the world's most emotional people. I cry at adverts, I cry at everything. So I have to kind of balance it. Um, you know, should I, should I watch this? Should I give it the attention that it absolutely deserves? Or will that be too much for me? Um, as, as pathetic as that might sound. Yeah. Well, I think it was just people, obviously, in a situation where they, 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 they felt they had a duty. Because the First World War is a conundrum to North for all people. What on, how yeah. on earth do we get in that situation? Um, but people who felt that they had a, a duty to... Um, their fellow countrymen. Um, that's 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 what came out uh, to me, and that they would, they would, they would sacrifice so much in in pursuit of that objective. It was just, it was beautiful, very very moving. I recommend it to you. Yeah. The war below. Did you? Think? I think it's called the war below, because um, I I was poorly over Christmas and New Year, not with COVID. I hasten to add, but mm. I, I, I I I I was confined to the sofa. And, and and the and the remote control, so I started to go searching for things to occupy my uh, befogged mind whilst I was recuperating, and that was one. I thought it was wonderful. Well, I met you shortly before Christmas, so I hope it wasn't me that gave you. No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. Did it work? How was your Christmas then? It was ever so good, um, um, because it, t- it, t- it it eventually because my my daughter came home from college. Uh, um, and then took a lateral flow test, and it was a, a positive test. So it totally upset our Christmas. We have a boy with a special needs who lives independently. He was going to come back to, to us for Christmas. That had to be cancelled. And then she's and, and now all the arrangements were we were hosting, and then we were not. And then she had a PCR test, which then proved uh, negative. So it was back to plan A. Um, so we were able to. Rescue the Christmas, so that was that was that was pleasant enough, and lots of lovely walks out into North Yorkshire, onto the onto the moors, and into the dales, and to the beach. So we had a, we had a, a it was a good it was a good uh, period to be with uh, with family. It was good. See, I'm in North Wales, so I'm always out walking with the dogs. I I appreciate it so much. The the, the greenery, the hills, the lakes, the rivers around here. Do we not appreciate these things even more now? I don't know whether it's been through this this pandemic. So these simple pleasures have just become so, so important to us all. I, I don't know, I'm, well, I speak personally, I, I think I appreciate it more than uh, perhaps I did uh, hitherto. Uh, it's what's right under our noses is often very beautiful and rewarding and refreshing. So I suppose that depends on how lucky you are with location. You know, um, I, I, I'm so grateful that I live where I live, but I did worry during the pandemic about those people um, you know, maybe in tower blocks or in sprawling estates with no greenery and nowhere to walk other than um, up and down your street, that sort of thing. I, I you know, I, I really felt so lucky that I had what I had outside. Absolutely. I, I, that, that was often on my mind. The fact that if you're confined effectively to, to, to one room, especially during the lockdown periods, what must that have been like? I mean, for your for your mental health. I was just going to ask you, actually, do you think we got the balance right between protecting mental health uh, versus protecting physical health? Well, we had a strange situation where we had our parks closed uh, during the first lockdown, and I protested vigorously against that because it was the very people who lived in very confined um, uh, circumstances, in small properties, living next to beautiful parks in the green lungs of uh, our town, um, they, that, that was, um, they were excluded from them. I thought that, that was utterly ridiculous. There was no scientific basis or health basis for that whatsoever. Um, and I thought, you know, we just 
taken a lifeline away from people who were desperate. You know, you can see them getting the, the children out in their buggies and people in wheelchairs and, and, and so on. You know, it was, it was vital for them. Um, so, yeah, we, that's got to be uh, on our mind. But as you rightly say, if you're blessed with, with you know, a garden, that, that, that of itself is, is a, a terrific boon. Or you live in a, an area that you've got easy access to, to beautiful, uplifting uh, countryside. Um, again, you're fortunate, but there are many people who just simply don't have that. And that begs lots of questions around the built environment uh, and building a better uh, environment for everybody. Um, and that should inform us in our thinking in terms of planning and town development and so on. Yeah, one of the things that I would advise for somebody that was maybe suffering with anxiety would be to get out there, experience nature, you know, enjoy the sights and sounds and feels and smells of nature. But, you know, if you can't, if you're nowhere near or maybe you've got a disability and would need somebody else to assist you in doing that and that can't be done, I, I don't I don't know, you know, that must have been really hard. It, re it really is difficult, um, but... Perhaps we just take the, the small opportunities that do present. Um, and you know, I, when I came into Parliament, I did take advantage of the mindfulness classes that were that were run for some time. Um, you know, you're supposed to make time to do these things. You've always found that the clock went against you and you couldn't attend. But the, the little bit I did do, I thought, well, actually just appreciate what's right in front of your... Under, under your nose um, and I think that's so so important for the, so those of us who can, can access these things. I shouldn't be shocked but I am shocked and extremely pleased that they offer mindfulness classes in, in Parliament, I think that's brilliant uh, Yeah, Chris Rowan uh, MP from, not from, far from where, where, where you are, uh, as was uh, he's, he's, he, he lost his seat, uh, he's a terrific chap and he um, was the leading light in, in promoting these uh, the mindfulness classes. They're still going on, I think. Uh, uh, I think. I think they're being resurrected, uh, but obviously COVID put pay to a great deal of that. But um, yeah, it was very, very useful just for a, a, a moment of, of, of calm contemplation uh, is, is so necessary, not just for politicians, but for everybody. I'm going to write to my MP now and suggest that he takes this up. I won't mention his name on here, but you know who it is. <laughs> you never know. No, no, but that's brilliant, though, because mindfulness is amazing. It brings us into the present and helps us appreciate what we have got, appreciate the things around us. Um, another big thing with the lockdown was loneliness. And um, on the same vein, you know, finding, finding the opposite where you can find it. And I took so much pleasure in just waving at the old lady down the road when we were doing the Thursday night clap for the carers and the, the key workers. In fact, that's why I started this podcast to sort of, um, I don't know, give someone something to listen to, but also to encourage people to talk to others over the garden fence across the street. <laughs> Socially distanced, of course. Oh, well, that was a, a, a remarkable uh, engagement I had a few years ago. I was at some event uh, um, in, in Westminster. I can't even remember what the event was, but there was something else going on in the building. And um, I was fascinated by all, all the book signings and all this a lot of activity. So there was a chap coming out of the uh, the other event. So I said to him, said, "What what was the event you were attending?" And he told me about it. Somebody had written a very uh, interesting book about issues such as mindfulness and the rest of it. Um, I said, "Well, what was the thing? What was the thing that you took away from that? What was the?" It, what, what did you find to be the most um, inspiring or, 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 or thoughtful thing? He said, well, the one thing was, uh, a tip was um, for, for, for a successful and happy mental state was to engage in conversation with a stranger. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, wow, we've just done that. <laughs> That's what we've just done, <laughs> just by saying hello to each other and just starting up the conversation. We, and, and within a few minutes you find out a great deal about somebody else and where the where the kickoff points are and you know the common interests and so on. But I thought it was quite fascinating just by asking him the event that he'd gone to, and he, he told me that was that was the purpose of it. 
And, and there it was, working in real time, talking to a stranger about talking to a stranger. I mean, I, I do think there's little things like that that the, that the government could, could maybe put out in adverts and stuff, little things that don't cost anything. And they would cost the government minimal, uh, you know, to put them out on adverts and stuff. Things like getting out in nature, connecting with other people, you know, talking to the stranger, learning a new skill, things like that, taking note of your surroundings. Um, things that when you're sat there in front of a TV thinking, God, I'm bored or I'm feeling a bit anxious, what can I do? Oh, well, there's an advert telling me that if I do that, it could improve that. So, you know, things like that. And like I say, it wouldn't cost that much. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. But you, you've got to have people you can you respect. If they're going to, te- if they're going to say things like that to you, 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 you've got to be well disposed to them, I think. That's, that's the true. difficulty with, with being a politician telling you that. It's because... Uh, uh, however well you regard there'll be plenty of people thinking I don't trust a, w- a word that bloke says well yeah especially if they're telling you uh, not to go to parties and then they're going to parties obviously no names mentioned well I've just, I just I find it quite remarkable um, Margaret Ferrier uh, uh, SNP um, Member of Parliament uh, uh, formerly no longer a member of the SNP mm. but, but her, her, um, her court case is starting for her breach of Covid regulations yeah. uh, I think Hang on a moment. Um, does that apply universally, or is it just selectively? Because I, I, I did. I thought we were going a bit like this. I, I actually wrote to the Metropolitan Police about the, um, uh, the, the the breaches at Downing Street. I said, "Well, look, what are you doing about it? You know, there's been a clear breach. I trust that you are investigating and, and prosecuting if necessary." And I got a response the other day, which said that ridiculous thing that, that it's not their business to investigate things that happened some time ago. I thought, I, well, I know Dominic Raab said it, and that's mad, uh, because every crime happened in the past. Um, yeah. I, I think you went out to Teesside Magistrates, and my constituents said, well, no, I'm sorry, sorry, Your Worships, no, I don't have to answer to this. The police shouldn't have brought this case because it happened 12 months ago. Huh? I don't think, I don't yeah. think so. Um, but that's what they've said. So I've actually written back and said, that is ludicrous. Um, review your decision. Um, and if you don't, then treat this letter as a formal complaint. And I want it. I want it responded to. You know, I rather agree with uh, is it Adrian Dunbar. You know, uh, and his uh, wonderful <laughs> broadcast outside um, Scotland Yard. You know, um, from the wee donkeys. Um, I I thought he was absolutely bang on. It's what people want to see. Everybody playing by the rules. That means everybody, not just. Um, uh, 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 the, the majority of the public and the elite uh, having another set of rules. They don't want that. They want it to apply to everybody. It, it, you've got to build that sense of um, uh, belonging and that we're in this, we are actually all in this together. Uh, and that's not what's happened over the last uh, several years, I regret to say. It's clearly been a different set of rules for pe- pe- people at the top. Yeah, absolutely. And I've heard a lot of people asking if uh, the police don't want to get involved because the police are always at Downing Street and then therefore they'll be implicating themselves. Well, I'm, 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 I'm afraid if that's the way it, 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 it is revealed, then so be it. I mean, you had um, Simon Case, the, the head of the civil service, he was appointed to investigate it and it was discovered that he, uh, you know, allegedly had had parties of a similar nature i never got that as soon as he was mentioned as the person that was going to be investigating these parties the first question that popped into my head the only question that popped into my head was was he at any of these parties exactly but we see this from time and time again you know they 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 go through these these terribly um opaque processes safe for the knowledge we all know where it's going to end up it's which is going to be um a whitewashing and an absolving of, of of responsibilities um, and that's that's really corrosive uh, if we if we we cannot see that the rules are applied without fear or favour. Um, um, you know, it, it it is it is corrupt. There's no other way to, to describe it, and it breaks faith um, with the public and their trust in our institutions. And uh, it is at a low ebb at the moment. Um, with politics, with people like the Metropolitan Police, um, that's not done them any favours at all um, if they're going to restore confidence and trust in their in their uh, discharge of their duties. Uh, Do they need it though? I mean, they've got the monopoly. It's not another police force to. 
No, there isn't anywhere else to go. They the, the want the, you know the, 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 these are the police forces that we've got to got to trust. I did used to work in the Metropolitan Police, so I'm not saying this from any position as a police hater, any in any stretch of the imagination. No, absolutely not. I mean, and, and because we all know that our, our the, the interfaces, the interactions that we have with 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 officers and and support staff are, are invariably good, uh, and we do trust them. We depend upon them to turn up in our hour of need. But when you get this lack of leadership from the very top of these organisations, they're not prepared to say, you know, out of my way, I will investigate this. I do have the authority and I'm going to do it. Whether this is to people's liking or not, I'm going to apply the law. That's what. That's all that we ask, is that the law that we're all subject to is applied to everybody in the same way. And that hasn't happened. Um, and, you know, that, that, as I say, it is corrosive if you allow that sort of exceptional exemptions to, 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 to apply to certain people. It just doesn't, just doesn't wash. So the people at the top need to be doing a hell of a lot more and the people at the bottom need to be looked after a hell of a lot more. Well, absolutely. That's, and we need, we, that's why I settled on my new deal for working people because I think there just needs to be a new settlement. And I was delighted to hear Keir uh, talk about a new contract it's 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 the same sort of language. I think we need a new settlement for people to have a a better return and a greater stake and a be, and a and a bigger voice in their own lives. And this is this is a real challenge for everybody now because we we look to leaders to deliver. And I I wonder whether that's actually the right way to go about it. There's an awful lot of interesting work going on around you know, grassroots. Um, organizations, people taking control of their own lives, finding their own voice. Um, there's some very, very interesting things going on at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm reading um, the work of Kate Rayworth. Uh, you may be familiar with Donut Economics. I mean, it's principally about, you know, not just the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or more broadly, but then about the things that hold life together, give people a, a, a good life. Uh, a decent, dignified life, you know, access to water, education, health, and all these fundamental things. But it's having that conversation in our localities. What sort of place do we want our town to be, given our global responsibilities? I think this is all a fascinating area. And I, I, I'm, I'm keen to see what I can do to develop this. Because uh, I see such successes. I mean, they've taken this, uh, this concept to... Toronto, to Amsterdam, to Preston in Lancashire, which people often talk about. Preston, the the authority there, is held out as a as an exemplar of how to actually engage with with the community. I need to do a bit more digging and investigating there, but I find this um, really interesting to, to start giving people rather than just simply sitting back and say, "Well, the government of the day just do what they do, and we just suffer it." Well, hang on. Yeah. How about us just having a conversation in our communities about how we exercise um, some control. Because, you know, that whole premise about the, the Brexit um, episode of take back control. Yeah, but who got the control back? It certainly wasn't the people. They're excluded. They're excluded from um, uh, their communities and what happens uh, to them in their communities. In the workplace, where is their voice? Um, you know, I've got an example here of this whole business of free ports, this corporate welfare on an industrial scale to attract capital, getting every allowance and tax break that could be, could be thought of. But where is the corresponding benefit for working people? Where, where is the opportunity for them to bargain and secure the best return for themselves so they can have decent, dignified lives with good, secure well-paid unionized jobs that's absent at the moment and i think it's going to be interesting to see how that dynamic plays out uh, but it's it's critical to get in a better life that we all want to see for for what well, the majority of us want to see for ourselves and our communities the vested interests want to keep the the status quo because it serves them extremely well and i think we should challenge it Absolutely. Well said. Well, let's end on a high. What are your hopes for 2022? Oh, the back end of COVID 
Um, I'm, I'm hoping to see improvements there. And if, and if not, then a better way of dealing uh, uh, with it. I would hope... Oh, this is really tough. Um, I, I hope for greater uh, honesty and integrity in our public life. Mm -hmm. um, I think this it's a real challenge to us right now. And I hope that some of the things that we've had to endure over the last several years, um, in at home and abroad, I hope that, 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 that those will change for the better. I think we need inspiration and leadership as well as freedoms for us to determine our own futures. Uh, at the moment, I don't see that. So I want to see that. I want to see that change occur. And that is um, how we leave that is, is, is a difficult one. But I hope for better times ahead. I think that's why everybody, well, certainly as, as, as politicians, I think everybody comes in and hope that things, things will actually get better. Uh, in in echoes of the famous song. <laughs> Ooh, 1997. <laughs> well, well, it's the song I was talking about. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining me today. I did say before we pressed record that I wish that my MP was more like you, and now I just wish that you were my MP. Um, thank you so much for letting me learn more about you, and yeah, thank you for thank you for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Richard. All the very best to you as well. Have a, have a yeah. great 2022. Yeah, you too. Take care and um, speak soon, hopefully. So all that's left for me to do now is to wish you all a, a nice 2022, basically. Same as I've just said to Andy. Enjoy the year. Hopefully good things will come. Hopefully things will get better. Go and experience nature. Go and talk to a stranger. Um, feel the benefit of it. And if you would like to get in touch, then I'm on Twitter at Richard Sefton3. Find me on there. Come say hello. Um, always like to connect. And other than having a good year, have a good week. Have a good day. Take care. Bye.